Good evening uh, and welcome to Shakespeare Hour Live. I am not Simon Godwin. I'm Dr. Drew Lichtenberg and I'm the resident dramaturg here at the Shakespeare Theatre Company. As you might remember or recall, Simon is unable to join us this evening for reasons that will become clear in the near future, I believe. But in just a moment, I'm going to introduce you all to our special guest co-host. Before we get started, I want to thank some of our sponsors. Tonight's episode has been generously supported by the DC Commission for the Arts and Humanities. And the Shakespeare Hour Live is a component of Shakespeare Everywhere, which is sponsored by the visionary Beach Street Foundation. Thank you to both. Now, let me introduce our incredible guest panel. The, th the title of tonight's hour is Shakespeare, Black Actors and Whiteness, The Past Uncovered. And indeed, it is a story often untold of the history of Black actors in Shakespeare, as well as the ways in which Shakespeare and classical theater stand in for whiteness in the cultural imagination. So joining me to talk about this expansive, ambitious topic uh, is Dr. David Sterling Brown, Assistant Professor of English at Binghamton University, an executive board member of the Race Before Race conference series. David, are you there? I am here. And uh, where, thank you for joining us, David. Thank and where me. are you calling in from, zooming I'm, in from? <laughs> I'm calling in from Norwalk, Connecticut, my hometown. My grandfather lived in Norwalk, Connecticut for a very oh, long small time. World. Small world. Yeah, they have, they, I believe they have a famous aquarium there. We do, Maritime Center. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I spent many times there as a child. Uh, uh, I did as well. Well, well, thank you so much for, for being with us. Thank you. Uh, we're thrilled to have you. Uh, my next guest is Carl Cofield, director, actor, and the associate artistic director at the Classical Theater of Harlem. Carl, are you there? I am here. Greetings, greetings. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me to be a part of this important conversation. And Carl, where are you? I don't want to be presumptuous, but I, I think I have an idea, but where are you zooming in from? I am zooming in from the Lenape lands in West Orange, New Jersey. So close to Harlem, but uh, a little bit out in the, about 30 minutes outside of the city. And you were just telling me before we went on the air that you are celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Classical Theater of Harlem this year which is the same as a famous anniversary for the Harlem Renaissance. Is that correct? Absolutely right, spot on. So it's our 20th anniversary. Uh, very important to us to pay homage to the community in which we were founded. The Harlem Renaissance is obviously the backbone and the pillar on which the Classical Theater of Harlem stands. So celebrating the centennial of the Harlem Renaissance, uh, although it's at COVID time, um, we, are, we are proud to uh, be of service to our Harlem community. And uh, I, I don't think I'm spilling any, divulging any secrets here, but I know you were, you were going to do Will Power's adaptation of Richard III that got shut down, and hopefully that will be resurrected this season. We had to close our theaters when the Amen Corner by James Baldwin was being performed on our stages. So hopefully these productions can live again. Absolutely, fingers crossed. Uh, and actually, this allows me to introduce my my uh, co-dramaturg on the Amen Corner, Dr. Sarika Colbert, the Vice Dean of Faculty and the Idol Family Professor at Georgetown University, and also the new Shakespeare Theatre Company Associate Director in our Literary Department, which is my department. Hello, Sarika, are you there? Hello, nice to see you. And uh, Sarika, where are you calling in from? I'm right here in Washington, D.C. in Georgetown. Washington, D.C. represent. Awesome to have you. Thank you for joining us. Thank and you. And last, sorry, but certainly not least, uh, it is my true pleasure to introduce my special guest co-host tonight, Leonie Noble. Leonie is STC's Director of Equity and Enrichment and the co-director of our recent virtual gala, which was a very big success. Uh, I watched it on YouTube. I know it exceeded its goal. Uh, and I hope all of you got a chance to watch. Leonie, are you there? I am here. Yes, I'm excited to be co-hosting with you again. It's been a while since we've co-hosted an event. I know, it feels like a million years ago when you and I used to do enrichment events in person together. 
Uh, and where are you calling in from, Leonette? I am calling in from Rockville, Maryland. Rockville. Rockville, the home of excellent uh, Chinese food and many other things. <laughs> there we uh, go. I wonder if you could tell us a bit, Leone, about your process developing the gala this year uh, and sort of what you learned that inspired you, what you weren't able to use that hopefully we can get into in tonight's conversation, and also why this topic now? What made, what made this topic of history, blackness, whiteness so feel so urgent now? Because I think it does feel quite urgent indeed. Yes, you know, working with Alan Paul, we uh, co-directed the gala together and we really wanted to show how Shakespeare spanned around the world. But we also came across wanting to share stories that had not been told before. And the past uncovered, which was a section that we did in the gala that we started off with, was showing us also what has happened with Shakespeare through time that people aren't really aware of. I, um, I had the privilege of attending Howard University where Ira Aldridge was a name and story that we heard very often as well as the African company. And I think of how knowing that we were doing this work at such an early time in the 1800s inspired me and let me know how limitless theater can be. And so not only do I feel this is important for us to uplift these stories to show the trajectory of theater and what, what it is now and why it is the way that it is now, but also to inspire those who think that classical theater is only for one group of people. Um, because it's important that we see ourselves. And this is an opportunity to uplift these stories and these companies. You know, I think it's so riveting to know that there were classical theater companies in the 1800s uh, when slavery was, was embedded all over the United States. And you had these group of black actors that were performing and creating and writing plays and, and doing this work. So um, I think it's important to tell the story now, but I think it's important that the story is just told. I think it should have been told well before. I think this is, it should have been told in the 1800s that we should have been aware of it then and what that would have done. So I'm excited that it's happening, period. And that we're doing it in this way. And it's also fascinating that these companies not only existed in the early 1800s, the African Grove Theater, uh, where Ira Aldridge saw James Hewlett perform Othello and Richard III, uh, but also that they performed Shakespeare's plays, that they gravitated immediately, uh, instantaneously, for some reason, to Shakespeare. Uh, and, and actually, in some ways, I don't want to take credit for the gala at all, but when we talked about Othello on the Shakespeare Hour, we talked about the play Red Velvet, which was produced in England in the last 10 years in, in America, and tells the story of Ira Aldrich and his experience as a black Shakespeare actor. Definitely, you know, and you think Ira Aldrich saw James Hewlett as a child. He was he was participating in the African company and he saw William Brown making plays and that helped to push him forward, even though he saw it get burned down a lot of things, the terrible things that happened within the company. But the fact that he saw black people doing Shakespeare at a very young age allowed him to continue to pursue it for many years to come. So the question we've asked our panelists, uh, Leone, is what might American classical theater in 2020 look like if the African Grove had not been burned down, if Ira Aldridge had not been forced to go to London and then Eastern Europe to perform Shakespearean roles? And also, what do we think the effect was on English and European theater that was more accepting in the early 19th century, uh, to some extent? I don't, I don't think we should get too carried away and say it was hugely accepting or hugely welcoming to a figure like Aldridge. Uh, David, I, I wonder if you have some thoughts on this very rich topic to share. I do, actually. Um, and thank you, Drew, for asking that. Um, I want to begin my thoughts by piggybacking on Leonette's opening remarks and sharing a quotation from a recently published book by Clifford Mason, because it is a bracing indictment of the theater world that I think speaks directly 
to the questions that we were asked to consider. Uh, in Macbeth and Harlem, Black Theater in America from the beginning to Raisin in the Sun, Mason forcefully writes, Black truth can only exist in a version that is denigrating, and the real truth, the one that has been burned into the Black soul, break the heart of me in all its rage and horror, can only exist beneath the grim, the feckless offering of pretending that Black men can beat up on white men the way white men can beat up on Black men in the real world of American coexistence. If the Black American wants to eat at the humongous pie of the American theatrical plentitude, he writes, he must do so with a pair of false teeth. No racism can be assayed, or at least not the racism that bites. Poor suffering Black people that white people have to rescue or whose demands are so modest that no one with a human heart could deny, these pass the muster, but that's all, Mason says. And so for me, the trials and tribulations faced in the theater world of the past and present by Black actors like Ira Aldridge, Henrietta Venton Davis, Ruby Dee, Paul Robeson, and others, they speak to the racism, inequality, anti-Blackness, and even erasure that have eviscerated parts of artistic Black history that we will never get back. These truths have no doubt also impacted scholarship and education as well. And that's, those are both important topics to me as a Shakespearean. Uh, the trials and tribulations, such as the destruction of Black theater in New York City that led Ira Aldridge to immigrate to the UK in 1824 at the young age of 17, reflect also the setbacks that have put Black actors today behind their white peers in an industry that still centers whiteness in ways that continue to monopolize acting roles, awards, and other opportunities. And when I consider the effects of anti-Black racism and the effects that it's had on actors, directors, et cetera, within the classical community, I become even more inclined to think about the question you asked from a different angle. What impact anti-racism has not had what it would have been like for Ira Aldridge and his contemporaries to live in a world where systemic racism was deemed a gross aberration from civilized and civil society. I also become inclined to think about the enormous burdens placed on black actors of the past and the present as they tried to perfect their craft, especially with respect to Shakespeare, while grappling with the racism-induced psychological abuse that undoubtedly proved to be distraction, as Toni Morrison has called it. If Aldridge had remained in the US, certainly the conversation that we're having today would be different, but given the status of today's world and the hypervisibility of anti-Black racism, given how much has changed but still feels the same, according to my 83-year-old grandmother who lived through Jim Crow, it's hard for me to imagine concretely what those differences would be, as there is no way to know Aldridge would have actually survived had he stayed. And thus, there is no way to know if we'd have the legacy of his that we have right now a legacy that makes Aldridge much more visible than his New York City counterparts from the African Go Theater. So those are some initial thoughts that I just wanted to share and put out there. I feel like I could listen to you talk all day, David. I, <laughs> I, I love the reference to false teeth. I wonder if that is uh, perhaps an allusion to George Washington and this notion of uh, foundational uh, uh, systemic uh, racism yeah, in American sure. society. And it is, it, it is indeed true that we, we have Ira Aldridge's story because he left right. and he proliferated. Exactly. Uh, and what are the names of the nameless actors who, other than James Hewlett, who were forgotten or never provided a chance to be on stages? Right. Uh, and, and yeah. And I mean, and, and, you know, initially Ira wasn't even the star of the African Grove Theater. So we're missing out on a lot. Definitely. Carl, you are a practitioner, a director, an actor, as well as a theater administrator, and you are at a classical theater in Harlem, a center of black professionalism and excellence and classicism. So how do you come to this conversation? And how does, how does it resonate with you? 
Um, first and foremost, let me just say I'm dazzled by the intellect of, of my esteemed colleagues tonight. I mean, that, that was just amazing, uh, Dr. Brown's insights into it. I'm going to come from it from a much more colloquial point of view, um, and that is the power of um, seeing yourself in the work and the, how that can shift a trajectory that can reverberate centuries. So let me, let me just start by saying that and giving you some context in that, because the Ira Aldrich story to me is quite personal, because until I saw a, a, a theater piece created where someone had the foresight and really a strength of imagination to really uh, break it and reimagine how it could be, that was the genesis, that was the seed that gave me permission to sit at a table where I thought I had been excluded. To me, that is my connection to Ira Aldrich. At the Classical Theater Parliament, that's what we set out to do. I don't think it's a, 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 um, an accident that one of the first things that are cut out of schools is arts education because it, it, it teaches us empathy. It teaches us how to remove ourselves and look at someone else's situation and really sit with that for two or three hours and Shakespeare being the prime example, dealing with human existential problems that people grapple with, that we all grapple with. So I say that to say when I see um, an Ira Aldrich do an Othello and say, oh my gosh, Sir Lawrence Olivier doesn't have to be uh, doing the role in blackface that has a tremendous, tremendous effect. Um, and often, often, I'm gonna pivot slightly, but stay with me. I think um, by virtue of uh, casting Shakespeare exclusively through a Eurocentric white lens, the unspoken nonverbal communication of that is people of color are not welcome at this table. And to me, that's just a failure of imagination. So to piggyback to the question you um, asked, where would we be? I think we would be so much further in our um, growth as humans, quite frankly. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use jazz as an example. Of course, we understand that jazz started in New Orleans through the classical European sounds. But the Africans then put their hot sauce on it and made it and created something that is uniquely American and uniquely ours. To me, that is the uh, rebuttal that I always give to people when they say, why as a black man who grew up in the South, would you want to spend time with Shakespeare? I come back to when Francis Scott Key wrote the Star Spangled Banner, it sounded one way. But when I heard Jimi Hendrix do the remix and put his flavor, his appeal and his aesthetic to it, it unlocks something completely different. So although I, we weren't here when Ira um, did his work, I'm gonna venture to say that somewhere in those audiences, it unlocked something that perhaps even Shakespeare, genius aside, might not have known was there. So, um, And lastly, let me close with, you know, uh, I think Ira is a long list of other artists who had, had to flee the United States to have their genius be shown. Uh, you know, I think of Josephine Baker, I think of Jimi Hendrix, I think of all of these other artists. And so then that turns me back to the question of what is going on in the United States that we cannot recognize and nurture our own talent. Um, so yeah, I don't want to bring, bring the conversation down, but that is the volcano of emotions and thoughts that come up when I think of where we could have been had we not um, gone out of our way to arrest the talent. Yeah, I mean, Carl, you could add Paul Robeson to that list, Richard Wright, James Baldwin. Uh, it goes on and on, the number of, especially Black artists who have had to leave America in order to speak in a, in their own voice, in their own American voice. And, and hearing you speak, I think of Ray Charles singing America the Beautiful. I think of Marvin Gaye 
singing the Star Spangled Banner at the NBA All-Star Game. I think of uh, this conversation that has been happening for centuries between white and black culture, which is such a profound idea and really is America. Uh, so Wika, you, you were talking before uh, we went on the air about how interesting you find this construction of whiteness as well as blackness. I don't wanna put words in your mouth, but I wonder how, how this resonates with you. Yes, thank you. Um, having this thought experiment has been really helpful to think about, you know, what would it have meant if Ira Eldridge had stayed in the United States. And to me, I went down a rabbit hole of history thinking about the abolition of slavery in the British Empire versus the United States, the abolition happening 30 years prior in the British Empire, and that coinciding with um, Aldridge playing Othello in um, England and how that provided a space, the shifting terrain around race arguably provided a space um, that was, although still contested, was broader than what was available in the United States. And I also think some about what were the predominant modes of theater for Black people um, in the 19th century, and those were primarily minstrelsy. And so what's fascinating to me about this history with regards to race is that we know both white people and black people participating in minstrelsy wore blackface. And so the question for us becomes, and whenever I teach this history to my students, I always ask them, why would a black person need to wear blackface? They're already black. And so part of what I think is happening in this moment is this clear distinction between race as a performance, blackness, versus a black person. And what happens in the 20th century, I would argue is that these two categories get collapsed. And so there's this messiness in the Renaissance period up into the 19th century, where we can see this play that's happening on stage around gender categories and then race. Even though the histories are very um, complicated and in some cases violent, there's still this understanding that what's happening on the stage is not um, reality, that there's a play that's happening on stage and there's a representation that's happening. And by the time we get to the 20th century, there's this understanding that race is written into the body. It's a biological category, particularly with blackness. It's something that we can see. And so whenever we see a black person on stage, we're understanding them as representing blackness. And so there's a collapse that happens. And I wonder if Aldridge had stayed in the United States, if there was space available for him to participate in different modes of theater, if there had been, if we could have continued this fluidness around theater um, and its representations of race in the 20th century. And the other piece that I'll say is what's interesting for, for me at least is that in the 19th century, theater was really pushing at some of the ways we were understanding race. Um, it, whereas the 20th century, it's really in line with how we understand race culturally and legally. And so there is this, um, correlation between race as a biological category and something that's in the blood via the Plessy v. Ferguson decision and the way that um, race is manifested on stage in that period. And so part of what I think is at stake is us really coming to terms with in our current moment how we see Black people on stage and how we can understand them as playing a part rather than playing their race and how that can open up doors, as my colleagues have said, for how we might reimagine the classical theater. And of course, the other piece that you know I'll mention, and you've already said this, Drew, is um, I've thought a lot about James Baldwin, as have you, and his going back and forth to Europe to get, to get his work done. And so the other piece that's useful for our history is thinking about how a separation or movement requires different modes of um, cross fertilization to happen. And so that Aldridge's travels also give us an opportunity to create new archives and for us to see him in ways that he would have been um, covered over perhaps if he had stayed in the United States. So I think that um, there's some opportunities for us to think about how race has been thought differently with regards to the stage in different periods of time, that it always hasn't been a static signifier of the people enacting the roles, and how that is newly open to us in the 20th century and 21st century as we understand race to be something that's constructed. And so the last thing that I'll say is, when we see people um, in the 19th century in the United States donning blackface, the representation there is really about a power dynamic in as much as it is about a certain type of people. 
And in the late 20th century and the 21st century, we came anew to recognize identity categories as as much about power dynamics as about physical characteristics. And so I wonder then how our theaters might come to acknowledge that history again in our casting um, and the way we understand classics and the way that we do our work. I'm so fascinated by this idea that you mentioned, Suika, of the minstrel mask of the 19th century being essentially a kind of theatrical construct that, is, that, rep that allows for a space of, I don't know, semiotic play in a way, and the rise of taking the mask off in the 20th century and the rise of Stanislavskian psychological naturalism actually creating a new essentialism of race and this, this uh, removing any allowance for artifice from the theater and for race to be played with as a category. Leonette, you have, a, you have a, a comment you'd like to share. Yeah, I just, um, so enthralled by the things that I just heard. And just, um, first what Dr. Brown mentioned, if Ira would have even survived. And I think of the treatment that the African Grove Theater received and what he witnessed and saw them arrest, arrested and forced to say that they would never perform Shakespeare again and literally saw the theater get burned down. This is a 300 seat theater that was burned down. And then going to Europe and just facing racism still, but in a different form through through criticisms and things of that sort, but not as so far as life threatening. Um, so I, I think of that difference. And then I also think of what Carl was saying in what we bring to the table. And Ira Aldridge, when I read the reviews that the critics said about him, they said that he brought a realism that had never been seen before and it made Shakespeare feel, feel personable. And I think of if he had, been allowed to stay here and not had his life threatened for performing Shakespeare, if how Shakespeare would look on stage, how classical theater would look, how it would have shifted and, and moved and connected with people in new ways. And then I think of what Dr. Soika Colbert just said in uh, Henrietta Vinton Davis actually stayed in the United States from 1883 and remained, she had a 30 year career doing classical works, but she was never allowed to do a full piece. So she wrote her own plays, but still faced so much that she ended up quitting and going into politics. And um, speaking of blackface, you know, she wasn't allowed to do these plays because of her race, but however, her skin tone was almost the exact same as her white colleagues, um, but they did not want her performing on stage. Uh, David, you want to follow up on Leonay's point? Yeah, so I just want to thank, first of all, Carl and Zoika for the rich contributions that you just made, because all of this has my head, um, you know, spinning and thinking. And something that I want to also, again, piggyback off of Leonette's um, comment there is violence, right? Um, violence is a significant part of this history and it's a significant part of why the history hasn't um you know why it was destroyed and we can think about the the physical violence that leonette just mentioned in terms of the burning down of of the theater uh, but also i think about the psychological violence as well that gets inflicted on people and so I was trying to make a link in my head between what was just said by my two colleagues about um, both Eurocentrism and right violence sort of being part of the commitment to Eurocentrism um, and to sustaining white domination. Uh, and then to Soika's point about um, race being about power, that is exactly how so many of my colleagues and I think about it in the early modern period. And so I really appreciated you saying that uh, because the violence is also, I think, a commitment to white power. Yeah, and, and I think that this speaks directly to a question that we've sort of hinted at or danced around so far in this conversation, which is a big one in contemporary theater, which is the question of casting. And we actually have some questions from our viewers specifically about casting. So it's great that we're all thinking along the same lines. 
Uh, one question from Jack and Nancy Gardner about Delaware Shakespeare's decision to recently cast uh, the role of Shylock in The Merchant of Venice with a black actor and what our opinion is of that. We also have a question of, from Barbara Harmon about race blind or color neutral casting, uh, which has been common now for many years, including at the Shakespeare Theater, has it not? So are we no longer going to be a color blind casting? Are we going to become color conscious? Uh, how does this play into the issue that Sawika raised about the authenticity of race versus the power dynamic, uh, the social construction of race? And indeed, as you're saying, David, the, the violence behind, the power behind uh, casting decisions. Um, so we got. So I would just say, I think it's important for us to acknowledge, you know, the history and the con context in which we are working. And so color conscious casting is really attractive because it allows us to attend to the context in which we're working, but also acknowledge that there is a robust imagination and possibility for this work that doesn't depend on reiterating other casting patterns. And I think the other, the move that is really dynamic and possible is thinking about creating these classical works anew, but not making them necessarily about race. And so how do we cast in roles that allows us to see the roles anew, but that does not then become a conversation about race per se, but really telling the story differently, thinking about it in different contexts. And I think that this has to do with all different types of casting choices, both in terms of race and in terms of gender. Uh, I'm curious for more thoughts from our panel. Carl, yes, you have your hand raised. No, I agree. I think it would just require a dramaturgical rigor and if you can prove you're casting a, a black Ethiopian Jew and you set it in a, a refugee settlement in Israel, we have, uh, I can make a case in an uh, aesthetical court of law that that makes sense. And I can prove it without changing the text, right? Because those are always the parameters that we're gonna be operating around. Well, you changed it to make it seem like, no, no, no there are cases that document that. And that's a true story of persecution. So I think if one is willing to, um, to flex that imaginative muscle a little further than we're used to, and to really push through dramaturgically and really make sure you're, um, you're making sense of it and, and you've thought it through, I think absolutely. I, for one, and this is just not a knock on anybody, I don't believe in color blind casting. As a director, everything I put up there says something. And it's up to our team to discern what that real meaning is. So my teacher would say, what is it and what is it really? So I'm purposely making a choice to make this, if, uh, to make this company resemble a 21st century world that I wanna live in. Um, and it's not what is, it's what could be. When Van Gogh paints the Spanish-American War, he's using his imagination to really go beyond the actual you know, naturalistic painting. And I believe, as August Wilson said in The Ground on Which I Stand, I believe in race as a social reality. Race is something that can never be neutral or colorblind. It, it exists, and it is part of our artistic language. David, uh, you have something to yeah, I'm so glad that both of you just said what you said, because I was literally thinking along those same lines um, as you were talking, uh, you know, for us in my field, we really try to think of color conscious casting and have moved away from this idea of color blindness, which can actually be harmful. Um, there's even psychological research that's done on the harms of, uh, you know, erasing a significant part of someone's identity. I am a black man and i want to be seen as such because if you don't see me as that then you're taking away a lot of the things that are important to me in terms of my history my experience uh etc and and so i think we need to be conscious of of color but as so you guys said um you know making strides to be conscientious also about how we do these things in the theater. And so the last point I wanted to make too, just to also jump off of what Carl said, is that uh, dramaturgs and theater directors can 
help the issues here a lot by doing the work, both in terms of research, so engaging with scholars who are eager to, to talk with theater directors and dramaturgs uh, about what they do so that what an audience gets, gets is an informed production that is rooted in even some of the critical material that um, we produce. Uh, so I think also having talkbacks with audiences after shows, directors are doing that more and more. Um, like Rob Miles does that with his online, the show must go online uh, series. And that's really helpful to get people to understand, you know, why did you choose to have a non-binary cast? Or why did you choose to do an all-female Macbeth, et cetera? Um, so just want to put that out there too. This is so rich and we have so much to get to. Uh, we are at our usual halfway point in the hour. So I just want to pause really briefly here, give all of my panelists a chance to shake out their hair and clear their heads uh, and remind you that we have some very exciting episodes coming up in the month of October, including two that will take us across the pond to England. So this month is sort of our global month where we are looking at Shakespeare around the globe. Uh, on October 21, we will be discussing Shakespeare and his relationship to British identity. Uh, and the following week, we will be collaborating with Simon's other artistic home, the National Theatre of Great Britain, for a special partner episode. So we will be announcing more details about those episodes. You can learn more and register for them by joining us on our website. Uh, but back to the question, uh, and really this very rich topic of casting specifically. And we had a question from viewer Michael uh, asking about uh, the Shakespeare Theater's own quote unquote reverse casting of Othello with Sir Patrick Stewart in the 90s. Uh, and he has a follow-up question, was that intended for white audiences to identify with Othello's challenges? Although Suika, you had your hand raised, I believe, before the interval. Now, I, I don't want to step on the point you were going to make, but I just want to add that to this rich stew of conversation. Well, I was, I was just going to say quickly that um, to the dramaturgical point that David made, many of Shakespeare's comedies turn on moments of misrecognition. So we can think of the character Viola, for example, as, uh, as an example of that. And so because embedded within Shakespeare's, many of Shakespeare's comedies are questions about how we recognize people, I think it gives us an opportunity again to think about how casting might enhance what's at stake in the plays rather than reinscribing our normative understanding of character. And so embedded, embedded into Shakespeare are lots of opportunities for us to think about character and how it relates to the individual person playing the role in different and dynamic ways. Um, and so I just wanted to add that piece. You know, it's really fascinating. This, I, I promise this is not too much of a diversion, but this morning I was talking to a playwright named Francis Cowhig about a play she wrote for the Royal Shakespeare Company that was an adaptation of a 14th century Chinese classical golden age play. And we were talking about the difficulty in casting it uh, in cities that don't have uh, as many Asian American actors. And she was saying, well, you could just reimagine the dramaturgy of it, Drew. You could make it an African-American story about the great migration and the separation of families. And she had this immediate response of, oh, just, just uh, have some more dramaturgical rigor, as Carl was saying. Have some more imagination with which you are imagining stories. Uh, and the idea, I think, of just completely changing the entire racial composition of the play uh, I think would terrify most theater administrators, which I think is part of what we're talking about here. There is a fear and a hesitancy to be brave in imagining the misrecognitions in Shakespeare's comedies, for instance, as being part of modern identity. We want to kind of, as you were saying, David, neutralize that or perform a kind of act of violence to the actors by not allowing them to be completely who they are on stage. Uh, so it's very, very complicated. Uh, we usually ask, uh, our guests to prepare a bit of Shakespeare, uh, a passage from Shakespeare uh, with which to sit with us. But for this episode, we wanted to cast a wider net and really talk about the relationship between Shakespeare and Black Americans. Uh, so Leonay, I know you've chosen a passage for us to listen to and think about, uh, and I don't want to spoil who it is. Are you willing to set it up maybe for us a little bit? Yes. Um... 
this is a passage from James Baldwin, but just as we were talking, I thought of a, a passage from Othello, from, from Iago. Um, so I think I'm gonna start with that one instead. Reputation is an idol. Reputation is an idol and most false in position oft got without intent and lost without deserving. And I'll say that again, I've missed, I've, there's one word I wanna change. Reputation is an idol and most false in position and off got without merit and lost without deserving. Speaking of Othello, we have a question from viewer Susan, who says that some contemporary academics argue that Othello is such a racist play, not a, not a play that deals in racial themes, but actually in racism, that it should no longer be performed on stages. It can still be read and studied, but not performed. And I believe this was Toni Morrison's opinion of the play. Uh, and she told the director, Peter Sellers, when he was directing Othello, what's, what's wrong with you? Uh, uh, so ha, yeah, the, the placement of Othello within the canon specifically, and obviously we've talked about Paul Robeson, we've talked about Ira Aldridge, we've talked about iconic Othellos, and it seems like it is the role, or it has been historically the role for black actors to play. How do we solve this conundrum? Or is it not a conundrum? You know, the, the first thing I think about is what we were just speaking about in casting. And in the 1800s, black actors were drawn to Othello because that was the only role that seemed to be clear for a black actor to play. And you think of the words that Othello says, and even James Baldwin brought up a great point in um, a speech he gave at, at Berkeley where he said, Othello says, I threw away a pearl richer than all my tribe. And the way that James Baldwin said, he said, my tribe, richer than my tribe. And I, and I think of the way that he said that. And if there were dramaturgs that were able to do the rigor as Carl was speaking during that time and to, sh and to shift um, these plays and find more roles, um, what that would have meant. David and Saluka, you both had your hands raised with this provocation about Othello being a racist play. David, I wonder if you want to go first, maybe? Uh, sure. So I am of the mindset that, yes, uh, you know, from start to finish, this is an incredibly racist play. Um, it doesn't really give us much room to see Othello in a positive light. Um, Othello is a pretty uh, pitiful character um, who then, of course, kills himself. And so I think for me, this play gets at, you know, it depends on the angle we want to look at it from, right? If I think about how the psychological violence that Iago inflicts upon Othello with his anti-Blackness um, and the lessons that can be learned from that, important, but who needs to learn those lessons? Um, do I, as a black man sitting in a theater audience, need to learn those lessons um, when life has taught me those lessons daily? So it becomes a question of, I think, the overbearing nature of uh, the racism. I also, so Titus Andronicus is um, hands down one of my favorite Shakespeare plays. And we don't get a moment like Act 4, Scene 2 in Othello, where Aaron, the, you know, comes out and is just like, is Black so base a hue and coal black is better than another hue and that it scorns it? We don't get that. And that is, um, that's hard to, to sit with. And so I don't know. I, I haven't seen Othello perform and I don't know if I would want to, I guess. And I, I think that's where I'll leave that at. It's interesting that Aaron the Moor is a much more openly villainous, anti-heroic character who does terrible things. And yet, as you point out, David, he has, he has a, uh, maybe not a death, but he deals head on with some of these issues of color and identity that in Othello, he never goes into that. It's, it's almost like he's trying so hard to be a Venetian the whole time that Iago gets all the language about color and race and identity. Yeah, and I mean, and Aaron does that in the context of trying to protect his black son. And so I think that that 
lineage that he's trying to protect. And also we talk, you know, I mentioned the term legacy when I was talking about Ira Aldridge that Aaron is trying to protect, I think is very important. And Othello doesn't have that either. He doesn't get access to it. Uh, so we got, I wonder about your thoughts. And I also wonder if you have a passage you'd like to share. Yeah, so just piggybacking on uh, what David said really quickly, the only piece that I would add is that, you know, we know that during Shakespeare's time in the Renaissance, his work was considered popular entertainment. And so in some of the debates that have emerged amongst contemporary Black writers about Shakespeare, including Toni Morrison, um, the question has begun to parse what is in Shakespeare versus the weight that Shakespeare holds in our culture and how Shakespeare serves to animate us questions around the classic, around the canon, um, around access and exclusion, and how all of those questions get manifested through the singularity of Othello, um, and not having a broader understanding of the possibility for Black people playing in the world of Shakespeare. And so I also think it's important for us to understand the distinction between how Shakespeare gets taken up in our current context um, versus what is in the plays themselves. And so along those lines, I too have a, a passage from James Baldwin um, from his essay, why I, stopped, why I Stopped Hating Shakespeare. And so much of the essay is about him struggling with, with the bard, but um, in this point in the essay, he's come to some resolution. And so he says, my quarrel with the English language has been that the language of reflected in my experience. But now I began to see the matter in quite another way. If the language was not my own, if it might be the fruit of the language, but it might be all my fault. Perhaps the language was not my own because I have never attempted to use it, had only learned to imitate it. If this were so, then it might be made to bear the burden of my experience. If I could find the stamina to challenge it and me to such a test. In support of this possibility, I had two mighty witnesses, my black ancestors who evolved the sorrow songs, the blues and jazz and created an entirely new idiom in an overwhelmingly hostile place and Shakespeare, who was the last body writer in the English language. Uh, Baldwin always going for the, the body links, right? The Revelation uh, continuum. Uh, Carl, I want to hear your passage, but we also have a question from viewer Sheldon asking us to discuss the character of Caliban. Sheldon says, I've always been disturbed by his treatment by everyone in the play, The Tempest, but especially by Prospero. Um, so you may, you may not want to feel that, uh, or you know, it may be fair game. Um, well, yeah, thank you for, for throwing that out. I will say um, I've had the privilege of grappling with The Tempest, so we had to have these conversations. Um, for our Tempest, we set it on the island of Hispaniola. Um, so you have an immediately dramaturgically built-in question of brown and black people saying this language and treating other people who are brown and black with a degree of cruelty, and what does that mean? So in our production, we had the brilliant actor Ron Cephas Jones play Prospero. Ron Cephas Jones, for those who might not know, is, is a, a very handsome, light-skinned black man. And saying those words to a darker Haitian brother, um, I hear again, I think that unlocks something different, that the audience forces themselves to think about the text in a new way. Oh, okay. What does this mean? So um, here again, I, you know, I don't know if, uh, how, if we were successful, it was successful to me, but to really um, interrogate the text through a different lens, through a multicultural lens, as opposed to just the lens of a binary black, white. Um, so that I think adds to a more robust conversation, a more 21st century conversation. Um, at least that's what we were we were pointing at in, in that uh, exploration. Yeah, I, I, I love that. I, I want to see that production. I'm sorry <laughs> that I didn't see it. And the thing I think about with Caliban is that he, other characters call him a monster throughout the play and talk about his appearance. But he is presented by Shakespeare as a human being who just wants freedom and who gets drunk and who, and who feels human urges. 
uh, I don't know if this solves the problematics of the character necessarily for a modern audience, but as Soiko was saying, there's what's in Shakespeare, and then there are the uses that Shakespeare has been put to socially by others, right? I think it's undeniable that uh, the, what's being dramatized in The Tempest is a kind of slavery, a kind of race hatred, a kind of dehumanization of the other. And we find it so troubling because we recognize it, because it's real. No, absolutely. And, and just to add to that, I think for me, what made sense dramaturgically was to explore the island of Hispaniola and why there might be a difference between the Dominican Republic and how we view Haitians. They share the same island. It's a different culture, but yet on a global scale, there's a different view and there's a different acceptance. Uh, so that was something that I thought, you know, when I was in theater school, they always said Shakespeare can stand up almost against anything. You can uh, set Shakespeare on the moon and, you know, have at it. So for me, that, that was the question I wanted to sort of interrogate a little bit closer to what if this magical island that Shakespeare describes was the island of Hispaniola. So anyway. David. Um, yeah, so just to add to that too, right, I think, uh, you know, Caliban is a figure whom we in that play can contrast with, of course, Ariel. And so we can see the differences in treatment uh, because of, you know, Caliban has these sort of African roots from his mother, Sycorax, and um, Ariel doesn't have that. Ariel's this airy spirit. Um, so we don't even really know what Ariel's uh, total makeup is like. But also, uh, you know, I think the treatment of Caliban gets us to think about colonialism um, and the impact and effects of colonialism and also the appropriation of lands. Uh, so what I love about The Tempest um, is the way that Shakespeare plays with the idea of the bottle, you know, or alcohol and the good book, the Bible in that play, um, and how he sort of um, preemptively shows us things that we then see when we consider colonization even in America and, you know, the Native American experience here. I think of William Apes, for instance, who was a Native American of the Pequot tribe. And he talks about in his autobiography, A Son of the Forest, how his grandmother was given alcohol by the white settlers and then she beat him until she broke his bones and he was a kid. So I think, uh, you know, The Tempest, it's also a tough play, um, but I, I think the criticisms that we can walk away from of, of the culture that is embedded in that play is incredibly useful. And uh, some scholars believe that Caliban is Shakespeare writing allegorically about the Irish, uh, who themselves were colonized by the English and who themselves have been associated with alcohol, alcoholism, uh, and have been otherized, right? M made the other. Uh, so yeah, I mean, race is certainly one lens for the Tempest and colony is entirely another. Um, this conversation makes me think of a quote by Amiri Baraka speaking to Rutgers students in 1984 uh, when he was the poet laureate of New Jersey, sort of in your neck of the woods, Carl. Uh, and he said, if the people that rule this country thought that you could understand what Shakespeare is really saying, they would remove Shakespeare from us. Shakespeare, if you really penetrate what he's saying, the reality of what that drama is, you will see that Shakespeare is a revolutionary for that period. So some, some sort of righteous words from the late Amiri Baraka. Uh, and Carl, did you have a passage of text that you wanted to share with us? Well, you know, the current political climate notwithstanding, but it's gotten me thinking about, you know, how Langston Hughes describes, um, the sort of second class treatment. Uh, and mine is gonna just be from King Lear. Uh, Thou nature art my goddess, for thy law my services are bound. Wherefore should I stand in the plague of custom and permit the curiosity of nations to deprive me? For that I am some 12 or 14 moonshines lag of a brother? Why bastard? Wherefore base? When my dimensions are as well compact, my mind as generous and my shape as true as honest madam's issue, why brand they us with base? 
with baseness, bastard, base, base. Who in the lusty stealth of nature take more composition and fierce quality than doth within a dull, stale, tired bed go off to the creating of a whole tribe of fops got between asleep and awake? Well, then, legitimate Edgar, I must have your lands. So that um, spoke to my soul about where we are in our political climate. Um, yeah. And it's interesting, Carl, uh, this, this speaks to sort of your point and your theme throughout the hour that Edmund is a white character, right? In Shakespeare, he's the bastard brother, but it's, it doesn't take that much dramaturgical rigor and imagination to see how a production in which you had an, a black actor playing Edmund opens up a whole new dimension to the character. David. Yeah, I was just uh, gonna add to, you know, this idea of speaking to the soul. Um, made me think of Keith Hamilton Cobb's play American Moor, which, uh, you know, looks at uh, or takes from Shakespeare's Othello and has us consider um, the black actor's experience, the black male's experience. And I think that play, you know, in conjunction with Othello, because it really teases out the issues that are embedded in that play for uh, this abject character, I think that can be useful. Um, and so I'm, I just want to clarify, I'm not against, um, you know, productions of, of Othello, but as I said, I haven't seen one. And I guess for me, as somebody who, again, deals with racism on the daily, I, I have to get to a place where I want to sit in a theater and just have that stuff coming at me because it's challenging. Yeah, it is. It's it's a really tough. I, I know Simon reread the play recently uh, because we were talking about it in season planning, and he he came back and said, "True, that is a really it's a really tough play to read and to sit with and sort of marinate in." And I we, we didn't really answer the question from the viewer about the Patrick Stewart uh, sort of photo negative, if you will, production of Othello. Uh, but I believe Ayanna Thompson has written about that production. Um, it's, it, it's inter it interestingly denudes the play of a lot of its meaning. Uh, it sort of renders it not meaningless, but it, it adds a new meaning that obliterates the pungent racism of the original. Uh, David, we're, yeah, we're, we're sort of out of time, but uh, no, go, go ahead. I want to I hear no, I'm gonna, I, I totally agree with you. And I think that um, in considering why it's necessary to see a black character in that role, given, especially given the play's language, I think um, the Patrick Stewart Othello was ahead of its time. And I still don't know if it's time for, for that just yet. Exactly, exactly. Well, this has been a, an amazing hour of stimulating conversation. Certainly I am leaving this with a, a lot uh, to think about. Uh, uh, Leonay, I wanna thank you so much for joining me as my special guest co-host. I also wanna thank David, Sawika, and Carl for making time in your busy schedules. Uh, we've sort of been the undercard to the, the vice presidential debate tonight, if you will. So, um, you know, ho hopefully, hopefully it's, a, it's a good night of viewing for you all. Next week, Simon will be back with us and our guests include local favorite, sorry, our theme is Shakespeare and Japan. What does Shakespeare have to do with Japan, my mother might ask? Well, mom, a lot. Uh, joining us will be local favorite director of the DC community, professor at Georgetown Natsu Onoda Power, actress Ako Dox, and Japanese scholar, translator, and the president of the Shakespeare Society of Japan, Shoichiro Kawai, who translated Hamlet for Simon when he directed it in Tokyo last year. So we hope you all will be joining us next Wednesday. Thank you all and good night.